Hello, good day everybody. This is Dr. Rina Khan, my clinical psychologist, psychotherapist and a speech therapist. And today, a lovely lady, a speech therapist and a mother of two, Charlotte, joined me. And she's basically a speech therapist. And especially in her introduction and in her bio, she mentioned that she's a mother of two children. So we will ask her that how she's able to manage both things. Because on her Instagram, I have seen she's doing lovely activities with her children. Thank you so much, Charlotte, for coming today into our live stream. And that Thank was even so kind of a, you know, our pending session, if I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I missed the last bit of what you said. I'm said that I, I'm saying that it's a, it was a kind of a pending session for us. You know, I I contacted you long ago, and you said that you're busy and you well, you have a lot of things to do. But thank you so much for giving us time today. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're welcome. Yeah, I'm sorry. As you said in your introduction, I am a working mom and I have two young kids and sometimes life is quite busy. And I'm particularly I have had no help with childcare for a while. So that was when the time that you contacted me, I just really needed to kind of prioritize spending some time with the kids. Okay, so how are you? How are you? They're doing well now? How are they now? Yeah, they're both doing really well. They're three and a half and five and a half. Um, yeah. And yeah, very, very happy, which is which is great. It's the most important thing. Yeah, that is the thing. And you know, when you become a mother, you actually understand the, you know, the milestone of the speech and you know, physical and cognitive milestone. That is the time when you actually understand the milestone. I'm sure you will agree to that point. Yes, absolutely. You're kind of always aware of the milestones and what should be happening. Um, and it's, you know, you're just sort of hypersensitive to everything. But I think also it really gives you a perspective of um, when you've worked with children for a long time, that recognition yeah. that whilst those milestones are important, we also know that all children are different. So in some yeah. ways it kind of helps you chill out and, and not um, analyze things too much because you have this kind of sense of you knowing that progress is the most important thing and not to be hung up on too much of like ages and stages. Yeah, that is important thing. And the thing is that, you know, uh, uh, you know, I ask this question because sometimes when you're a therapist, then you're too much, you know, uh, wearing a kind of glasses, crucial glasses for your own children. Uh, because a lot of uh, working mother to come to me and they, they're a therapist as well. Sometimes they ask me some kind of questions which are very concerning that why our children is not able to do certain things. And that end of the day, the thing is that every child is different. Uh, uh, it's not just about, you know, on spectrum or children with special need. Other children are taking their time as well. So instead of, you know, uh, there are some uh, red flags and a lot of things which you need to consider, especially when you talk about, uh, you know, speech mm -hmm. as well. So, yes, there are some points when you have to consider these aspects, but you know, if it's normal for course of development, then you need to, you know, let it go and uh, follow the natural course. I'm sure you like agree with that point as well. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. I think it is hard sometimes to um, take a step back as a parent when you're also trained in an area. And I actually quite early on realized, and I still do this now, sometimes when I'm feeling confused about something, I say to myself, how would I respond if someone came to me at work with this question? What would be my advice to them? And I find it really useful, actually, to be able to detach myself a little bit in that way and think about what advice I would give to another parent. Oh, yeah, that's a very uh, interesting. Okay, uh, today we would also like to talk about, you know, the topic of our today's discussion is functional communication. And the yes. reason for this uh, uh, point is that a lot of mothers are, you know, uh, contacted me and they have, you know, uh, saying that our children is able to uh, name different things. For example, it could be transport and it could be fruits, it could, it could be vegetable. And they know the ABC and they know the phonics as well. But as far as functional communication is concerned, they don't know how to ask something they don't know how to uh, request something because when you're hungry then at least a child is able to point out to something that i need this thing i am thirsty i need this thing but children are lacking these skills so that is the reason that's why i uh, was you know eager to go toward uh, functional communication that which is very important and i would like to uh, uh, ask you that how you're going at home for example if you have a working mother how you can work on these things at home um, on functional communication yeah, you're right. It's so important. And a lot of the time when parents are kind of focusing on academics, they're really keen for their children to learn numbers and letters and colours. And those things are great, particularly if your children are interested in them that, you know, you absolutely can talk about those things. But it's really, really important that children have these functional communication skills. So as you said, that's things like being able to tell you what they want, being able to tell you if they don't want something, being able to ask for help, 
being able to tell you if they want more, being able to express their emotions, um, being able to tell you if they're hurt and, and knowing body parts is really useful yeah, true, true, true. as well. So really like functional things. And sometimes that could be expressed non-verbally. So there isn't always a pressure on getting children to say these things. If your child's not quite at the stage where they're ready to express those things verbally, we need to give them an alternative way, as you said, you know, can they point to show you what it is that they want? But really for young children and for children who are developing their communication skills, we should be prioritizing those functional language skills above and beyond um, numbers, letters, those academic things a bit more. So in terms of what can be done at home, I guess just really have a think, you know, if you are a parent, is your child able to communicate these things? Look for the gaps, because it may be that your child is fine to be able to tell you if they want something to eat and drink, but actually they don't have a way of asking for help. And the reason why these things are so important is because um, often if we're not kind of giving children opportunity to functionally express themselves, they can get really frustrated. And also parents get really frustrated as well. So it makes interaction like a negative thing. And actually the most important thing for language learning is that it should be a positive thing. The parents and the children should be having fun. So maybe make yourself a little checklist and just ask yourself, can my child make requests? Can they ask for help? Can they express their emotions? Can they tell me when they don't want something? Do they greet other people? Um, can uh, they tell me when they're hurt? Maybe make yourself a little checklist and it may be that they're not able to say those things, but they are able to communicate that with you through using gestures or pointing or something else. Um, and where you've got those gaps, think about what you can put in place to support them to do those things. So the majority of times it will be a case of you just need to model that for them. So for mm -hmm. example, if they don't know how to ask for help, you need to like little create little situations where they've got an opportunity to ask for help. As parents, we often anticipate children's needs and actually creating or just pausing um, to, so they've got the opportunity to ask for help is really important. So with little things like um, if they're putting their shoes on and they can't quite do it themselves, rather than rushing just to do it for them, just lean in and see if they will ask for help or the same thing, like if they've got a snack that they can't quite open themselves, Rather than just rushing to do it, pause, lean in, show that you're there, but see if they'll do something to ask for help. And it may be that initially they might just kind of pass you the shoe or pass you the snack. Then that's an opportunity for you to say the word. So using single words in this instance is really powerful. So just being like, help, help. Mm -hmm. And if you can repeat that word over and over again, that's brilliant because we know that children need to hear words repeated hundreds of times before they're going to understand what they mean and then many more times before they're going to use them themselves. And I would always use uh, maybe some sign language alongside talking. I think being able mm -hmm. to see something is really powerful. So um, mm -hmm. in the UK, we use Makaton sign language alongside talking. So, for example, help would be this. But sign systems may vary across different countries. That's fine. As long as you're using some sort of gesture alongside your word, that's really helpful. Mm -hmm. You are very much right because the thing is that uh, because I, I also think that when you use the word help, you can start. You know, uh, when we talk about gestures or when we talk about you know helping the child, if the child is not able to do, because according to my opinion, because I'm a therapist as well, I go to a supportive kind of way instead mm -hmm. of you know pushing your child because sometimes pushing uh, every child is not okay with pushing. Sometimes they become in the judgmental position and, you know, they, they step backward as well. So instead of, you know, pushing them to say something, push, pushing them to do, why don't we go in a supportive and we say that, oh, do you need my help? Okay, let's do it together. We can do it. So when you see that the child is doing, the child, they will, you will say that the child touch your hand and he will start doing, and he will try to do this thing as well. So I think it's a very positive thing. And, you know, what I think is that, um, these things start, start with small things. You don't need to have a very fancy gadget for these things. You don't need to have you know, fun, uh, uh, expensive gadgets to get into these things. And you can do these things simple because uh, I actually offer a program which is, which is in a home-based therapeutic intervention plan in which I use all the things which at home. So you don't need to have something, you know, therapeutically expensive thing to do this. For example, if you will go towards sorting, so you could have, you know, a cup kicked in in which you can uh, sort different things. So you need to be a little creative as well. But you know, the thing is that I think uh, sometimes uh, why mother need to understand and know these things because th as a therapist, you are, you know, too much. For example, you're saying that you have a lot of work to do. So as a therapist, it is very difficult for a therapist to talk to the mother every day. What mother could do, 
she could take some guidance and she could apply these things at home that's why i uh, I, i started you know these uh, live session on the uh, on my channel on my facebook page so that at least start getting understanding of the idea that what it is actually because when people don't know something for them it's a very difficult thing you know mm-hmm. when they start knowing that thing when they, they when they start understanding that thing when they start understanding the disorder for example if they get that level of autism so they they think that their life stops their child life stops so they don't think about other than autism other than their diagnosis so i think they need to see okay what we can do about that so um, i would like to share one case example with you um, uh, that's that you know that case stuck in my mind actually the mother was you know very high achiever mother and she was very good in academics she got a son and um, uh, the son have autism and she was all the time teaching her son different things for example it could be some kind of concept in the sense of numbers she wanted her child to you know be just as brilliant as like herself as well so she start teaching her, her son uh, one two three a b c 2 plus 2 is equal to 4 so one day uh, and you know she was not even able, able to understand where she is wrong whenever she used to take her child uh, to at some place uh, and whenever somebody asked how are you he would say a b c d e f g h i j k l m n o p how was your day 2 plus 2 is equal to 4 so every functional communication question was coming in the response of alphabet and letters and that ch- child was capable of doing more i mean if you start going work with that child the child could but you know uh, mother was not able to understand where i'm wrong mm. you know yeah. and somebody have to tell her that there is something wrong with this communicate this pattern of communication and and you know what she was so tense that she don't even understand what can i do so even she can you know change these things you know uh, i was just reading a post it was about some special interest that how you can use some special interest for example if child is uh, interested in abc so you can add some color you can add a lot of words that start with letters so you know it's it's a kind of fun way so uh, i'm sure you would agree to these thing because uh, functional language is very important and uh, telling you uh, and i always always add body parts because at least your child is able to point out some body parts that if it is he is hurt or not because sometimes it could lead, lead to some kind of emergency situation and you never know what, what you have to do because sometimes if child has some kind of severe pain in his stomach his abdomen then it could be a medical emergency so at least the child is able to uh, you know uh, point out to some body part that i am hurt okay so i would like to ask a question from you is that uh, okay if if, if you're some mother and she's not that much educated or uh, she don't know or she don't have that much time what she could start with her child to go towards functional language i mean some simple activities what she could plan for her child sorry i missed the first bit and i hope i'm not sure if it was important is this just generally if somebody has approached me um and they want to know where to get started yeah yeah yeah, yeah. if it's a mother yes what she what she will do yeah. at home so firstly i think um what you said before about um not needing expensive equipment is really important so one of the reasons why i started speech therapy with charlotte is because i noticed that there was so much that i was doing with my own children because of what i've learned through work but all of the stuff that i'm doing isn't like fancy speech therapy games it's just i will basically make the most of the activities that we're already doing together so i think firstly just lose this idea that there's particular things or games or activities that you have to do because there's not but there's little tweaks that you can make to um kind of make the most or support your child's communication development so first i think it is really useful if you kind of know as we talked about before what kind of functions they don't have so that you can kind of work on them it's also really important for you as an adult to model that functional language to them so you know if you're working on um being able to answer as your example how are you then you as an adult need to be asking the other adults in the house or if there's other children in the home you need to be model answering you need to model answering and responding to that question yourself so that they kind of know what that social situation is so lots of modeling yourself and then there's some key things that you can do just to make the most of the interactions that you're having so the first thing that you need to do is make a connection with your child so getting face to face with them when you're talking to them is like beyond powerful that's the most important thing that you can be doing also just making sure that they're kind of taking a lead in the play which i know lots of adults find really hard but there's just so much evidence to show that children will learn so much more if you're joining them in an activity that they find interesting as adults we 
often tend to try and direct the play or the way that the interaction is going. We've kind of got in our minds an end result or still something that we want to do. But for a child, it's so much more powerful if you can just take some time to join them and play in the way that they want to play. The other thing that's really important for children who aren't talking so much, and that might be just because they're young and they're developing their language skills, or maybe there's a speech and language difficulty. There's evidence to show that for those children, we are filling those gaps, filling that silence by trying to do too much of the talking ourselves. And whilst it is really useful for us to model communication, as I said before, we also need to have a bit of a balance. So we need to give models to our children, but we also need to allow them time to take a turn in the interaction themselves. So we can say something and then we wait for them to respond in some way. And it's a bit like, um, I like to use the analogy of a tennis match. So you're, you're serving the ball over the net, but then you're waiting for them to return it in some way before you're going to go again. And that's what's sometimes missed with younger children or children with speech and language difficulties. We need to, as I was saying before, with the example of um, kind of getting them to ask for help, I might give them the packet and then I'm going to lean in and wait. And in that waiting, I'm basically giving them the chance to take a turn. And it may be that they're not going to say anything in that turn, but they might do something nonverbal, like give me the packet back. And then my turn will be to say, help you want help and then mm -hmm. they might know and i'll go yeah you want help i'll help you so it's mm -hmm. kind of like a to and fro sort of thing and then also what's really important is um repeating the same things over and over again so if you're trying to teach your child body parts don't just say oh i've told them head shoulders knees and toes one time you mm -hmm. need to do it all the time you need to repeat those words throughout the day over many different days in many different activities so it may be that one day you're playing with bubbles and you're talking about where on the body the bubbles are popping and then the mm -hmm. next day you might be baking with your child and you notice that they've got a cake mixture on their hands so you need to be talking about their hands and the fact that there's cake mix on their hands and oh no I've got some in my hair so you you just need to be repeating that language mm -hmm. over and over again. And you know, there's uh, like you was talking about uh, body parts, and it's very like it's important to teach them body parts. So there, uh, you know, what I used to tell the parents is it's very important because whenever you're changing your child dress, because you have to change your child dress once or twice in a day. And second thing is whenever you're using the washroom, because that is a time because the child have to go to washroom maybe three to four times a day, more than that. So repeatedly, you can do this activity by telling the child different body parts. So I think. Uh, the thing is that, uh, uh, and you know, the, the important thing is that you had, you need to be patient with the child as well, because from one activity, you don't can, you know, you don't need to, uh, uh, you could say, we start, you know, thinking about the result all the time, when our child is going to talk, when the child is going to respond. So when we see that the child is not responding, but we do, we just left our efforts. And it happens in a lot of cases that parents lose their hopes, parents lose their, you know, the efforts they are doing. And, you know, uh, but... But how it's coming in front of us, it's come up, you know, depression and anxiety and frustration as well. So instead of, you know, trying more, they, they start getting frustrated and, you know, and they start getting, taking guilt of that thing as well. And they think that it's something wrong with us and something wrong with our methodology, that we are doing something wrong. And the thing is that the child is taking time to learn that thing. And sometimes, you know, in a lot of cases, uh, maybe you have seen that thing as well, that uh, the child is not responding in the session, but the child is born at home. And a lot of parents used to say these things. You know, there was a child, a child come to me and the child used to have, you know, uh, some kind of, um, uh, the, the child was CP and he, he had physical disability as well. So, and half of body, body was not working. So I used to teach him his name. So, and I was, you continuously doing that thing for a month. And I was, you know, did a different techniques and daily I was doing that drill. When the PTM came and the parents come to us and then they told me that when the child is coming to school, the whole you know, in the whole way, the child is taking his name. And I was not familiar of the fact, but the child was not responding in the session. The child was not responding in the whole time and he was at our pace. So I thought the child is not responding. And, you know, you can get this idea as well. But the thing is that you need to repeat that thing in different aspects instead of, you know, uh, responding for, you know, uh, waiting for the time the child will respond to you in any way. Most of the time, the child don't respond. And you will add that point as well. Even the child understand that thing. And how you could know that, for example, if you see where's apple, if a child is looking toward apple, it means that the child know the apple. Yeah. I'm sure you get this idea. 
Oh, yeah, I do. And I totally agree. And I think that that is something really hard because it can be really disheartening as a parent if you're not seeing quick progress. And we know that children progress at different rates. So actually, if you've witnessed another child seems to be picking up things really quickly and your child isn't, then it might feel like no progress is being made. But often it is. I like to use the analogy of sometimes when we're doing these things, we're like planting a seed in the child's brain and we are waiting for that seed to grow and each time we're interacting with them we're kind of watering that seed and we're waiting for it to kind of flourish and grow and I think sometimes people don't realize how many hundreds of times children need to have heard a word before they're going to learn what it means and then how many more hundreds of times they're going to need to hear it before they feel confident to use it themselves and I always try and use that analogy when I'm working with families as well and just as a really great example I've been working with a little girl with autism recently and um, we do these things very consistently. I use that routine and repetition um, and maybe we've had, I don't know, five sessions so far. Um, and then on the fifth session this week, we've been using a visual timetable to explain to her what's happening. And she's she's almost been like acting as if she's not even aware that the visual timetable's there. But I said, I'm still gonna use it for the consistency. I think, you know, we can work towards her actively using this timetable later. And then in this week's session, um, we came to the end of the session. And I said, oh, now it's time to say goodbye. And she ran to the door. She opened the door for me and she gives me a hug on the way out. She's shown no awareness before of what that visual timetable means, but because we're using it in such a consistent and repetitive way, it is all sinking in. And I think that was really powerful for the parents of that child to look and see, oh, okay, it is working. <laughs> and the thing is that most of the thing, uh, what I believe is the child is getting that thing. This is what I believe. But you know, the response time is their own. But the thing is that, it's, you know, I think when, we, when you're working with a child, it's more about how supportive and positive environment you're giving to a child. Because a child is shy. Maybe a child is stubborn as well by nature. So that moment that he will, you know, uh, uh, there's one very effective techniques that you need, you, you, you know, you uh, record the session. Or you record the voice of the child when he's talking. And you just show that recording to the child and see how happy he is. And he's astonished as well. And I have seen repeated the second, the child was so astonished. Or he was like, oh, I, I talk like that. It's me. So he, he, you know, he got that encouragement as well. So there's a lot of different things um, uh, to use the child encouraging. And most of the time, what I believe is always use a supportive way. Because as mother, when a child, when children are at home, you need to uh, say what you are doing. And you need to tell them what you want. Because a lot of time, uh, what parents are saying that the child is not uh, talking to us. And the child don't understand. So... The child is not listening to us. The child is not call, following the command. So what I tell to them is that you need to show them what does you meet from opening a door. How you can do that? So you need to open the door first and you take the child and you need to open the door because this is how you're cheating a child. Because child thinks, I cannot do that thing as well. So you're just encouraging a, ch encouraging a child to do what you want to do and helping them what to do. And uh, uh, that is very important because, for example, everything starts with help. Because when we were children, we don't know these things. Somebody teaches these things. That was our parents, our relatives or from the environment. But there was some place where we were teaching. We were able to understand these. But now, you know, we are a lot of people are living in single family unit where these things are more challenging because when people used to live in joint family system, they have a lot of support. So children used to get a lot of, you know, a model, life model in their home as well. But now people are living in too much, you know, isolated family unit. So Sometimes they provide, you know, a, a screen to their children. And child is, you know, saying whatever they watch in the children. So if the child is able to copy that thing, it means the child is able to copy you as well. The child could imitate you as well. You need to, you know, use these things. Um, uh, okay, I would like to ask you another question that uh, um, when we talk about communication, before communication is language, before language is about verbal and nonverbal communication or receptive and expressive language. So how can we work on receptive language which will turn into expressive language? So if we talk about the you know, basic thing about receptive language. 
Mm -hmm. So, yeah, there's lots of different skills that are involved in communication and often expressive language, which is a child's ability to express themselves, is something that is the much more visible thing. So it's really obvious to people around them whether or not the child is talking or not talking. But we kind of miss some of those things. I, li I like to uh, visualise it as like a pyramid. And so there's some other foundational skills that have to be in place first before a child is going to use their expressive language. So further down that pyramid, but what's often kind of like hidden below the surface is things like social interactions, uh, attention and engagement skills, and also receptive language, which is understanding others as well. And they're really important functional skills um, that are providing, as I say, that solid foundation for children. And for most children, they tend to develop from, well, I was going to say birth, but actually there's lots of evidence to show that some of those skills, they develop in utero, actually. Yeah, it's it, is, it is actually, <laughs> it's actually, and I would like to share, uh, you, you just complete your uh, sentence. I would like to share a very uh, interesting story with you about that. <laughs> that a child yeah. had their skill before birth. <laughs> you know, yeah, there was you a video. Go, you go ahead, you go ahead. It's interesting. You know, there was a video, and there, there was a video, and they have twins. The mother was, uh, you know, pregnant twins, babies. And uh, they were, the mother went for, uh, you know, uh, that, you know, for your teen checkup. And when she yeah. saw her, I don't know what it's called, sonogram or uh, uh, what it is called, actually. So she saw the children was fighting with each other for space. I love that. <laughs> they were fighting with each other for this space. So that is interesting thing. So, you know, uh, even if you talk about emotions, three basic emotions is, uh, you know, uh, happiness, uh, sadness, and cry. These are by birth. And with and research shows that those children who, who are, you know, uh, who don't have, uh, uh, you know, hearing, or who don't have even vision, they can, they even have that emotions as well. So these are things by birth. So if we t talk about these things, even the child at age of, you know, uh, eight month, the child have the concept of 3D, uh, you know, four dimension, actually. So we think that the child fall, the child uh, fall sometime, you know, uh, the, the child don't fall, actually. He know that I'm going to fall, that's why he don't go to that danger. So he had the concept of danger as well. So you know, these things are basically you learn from that. And uh, most of the time, you know, you say you need to talk a lot of positive things. That is the reason that we say that we need to talk a lot of positive things in front of the child. And we need to give a very positive environment because if a mother is happy, definitely the child will be happy as well. So that's how, you know, human being is very, uh, you could say, interesting creature of the God. So that's how they think. <laughs> Very interesting. very interesting they are interesting actually and you know uh, when you work with a child you the child you know uh, you get astonished from the child because uh, i will i would like to you know mention the morning case uh, there was a very, very interesting incident who happened in the morning a child came after two three uh, days off and he came and you know he was uh, working with me and we were working so the other child go to that child and he was greeting that child actually so he was hugging that child he was touching him a lot and the child was getting annoyed and the child was just like that Teacher, give him time out. I mean, he was not saying him to uh, uh, that I'm getting annoyed or don't touch me like that and you're hurting me. He just starts saying, teacher, he, he's hurting me. Uh, give him time out. So that, that is the way. And it was astonishing for us as well that the child is not that much communicative. The child is, you know, with, uh, the child have uh, some form of intellectual disabilities. So uh, he's seven, eight years old as well. So, you know, that is an interesting thing for us. Before that, the child did not show these, you know, social communication skills. Or you could say he, instead of, you know, saying something to that child, or instead of pushing that child, he came to an adult and asked him for help that, please help me out in this situation. If I will hit that child, it means that I'm going to fight with that child, you know. So this is what we are called, you know, social rules. And, you know, socialization skill and age appropriate activity as well. So, you know, these things are interesting and these things make most of your day. So, um, okay, if it... Uh, Okay, if, if when you were talking, you just mentioned that uh, uh, important skill before communication. So I would like you to elaborate these skills because parents used to think that uh, if a child is start communicating, then his issues are going to resolve. I'm talking about those children who have special needs, who are different, who have autism. So is it just about the communication or we have to look the aspect of behavior part as well? In terms of supporting the, the young person, yeah. 
Yeah, of course. Well, we just need to look at everything, you know, look at the whole child. Most people who have um, any kind of developmental difficulty, so that would include special needs and um, particular diagnosis like autism, they might be likely to have communication difficulties, but difficulties in other areas as well. And I think it's really important for us to not just see the child as a whole person, but the family as a whole person as well. So we really need to think about like what's going on for the child and the family as well. And I I'd love to think that we can all work together as a team. So that might be the family, the child's education setting and any outside professionals or specialist professionals like speech and language therapists, psychologists, all get together to really holistically see that child as the bigger picture because on top of any um, developmental difficulties they may have the family might also have other things going on so there might be other stresses in the family things like housing difficulties financial worries um, health issues um, bereavement you know we know families are complex, right? Yeah, so yeah, yeah. I think we have a real responsibility when we're serving families to try and all work together and just see the bigger picture. And you can't work on any one thing in isolation, but also you have to acknowledge that there needs to be the right timing for things as well. So, you know, maybe if there's lots of other things going on for that family at the moment, working specifically on functional communication is not their priority because there's something more pressing and that's okay. We maybe deal with that first and then we can address the kind of communication difficulties later on. That's that's my feeling is that you can't treat any one thing in isolation because they're all so linked. And uh, I, I would like to, you know, I, I very much agree because uh, very few people understand that family is very important. You know, whenever uh, parents come to us, whenever the child came to us, and they think that this, it is just the therapist's responsibility to work on that child. So uh, I would like to give you another example. And you know, uh, maybe those who are listening to us, they will get the idea how family is important. There was a girl coming. She was a lovely girl, and she was with autism. But she was, uh, with the help, she started communicating. And in start, she was only on words. And she came on two or three, she started her sentences as well. So uh, all of a sudden, she started crying in the uh, eating time. And she gave us, uh, like, she gave me a lot of tough time. She would cry and she would cry with, you know, you know, we use the, word, the full mouth, with a full volume. She used to cry and she cried for at, at least two weeks. And I, I, I was not able to understand what is, what is wrong with her because at that time, whenever, you know, in some institution, there, there's this possibility that you cannot uh, go and talk to the parent directly. Uh, before I was, uh, you know, I was working in some place. Now I have my own institution. So mm -hmm. over there, I was not able to get to that parent. So again, when I get the idea, then parent, the mother told me that the mother was out for 15 days. Mm -hmm. And those are the same days when the child was crying. And crying continuously. And, you know, as a therapist, you know, sometimes, okay, if you say that the child is doing this for attention-seeking behavior. So sometimes, you know, as a uh, as a therapist, you know, people used to say that you have to control your emotions as well. But sometimes, you know, you feel very bad about that person. Child answers that I'm not able to, you know, have that child. I don't know what is going on with that girl. But mm -hmm. if you say that if you work with a parent, which is very important for us, and they need to understand this thing that it is very important to work with a therapist. It is very important to say think directly you need to be very you know honest with the therapist that what is going in the family what is the situation in the family because you know uh, for example uh, i am working with a child over here i'm working on his five motor skill and i'm teaching the child how to write which is very important because if a child is special and he can, we know we know that he cannot go to normal school but at least we can teach the child to write their own name we can teach the child to you know count some money some basic skills so that maybe he can uh, open some shop and work over there so I saw the homework. It was very random homework. It, it was very clean homework. And then I was discuss, discussing with the other therapist. And she showed me that I asked the child. The child said that my mother dis, did this work. So I tried to admit to the please kindly ask them not to do that, that work. We will complete his work over here. We will ask help the child to complete his work. But don't do the child homework because this is what you are doing. You are just you know creating hindrance for the child. You are not helping the child actually. You know, it's not a good kind of help. You're just, you know, uh, uh, taking uh, time out or, you know, you're just, you know, uh, uh, doing the thing so that uh, the blame, you know, uh, a lot of parents are in the blame that the child did not uh, did this homework because the mother, maybe the mother was busy. So instead of, you know, doing the child homework, you might say that I was busy in some place. So the child did not do his homework. So I think if you're real with the therapist, if you're with the, um, you know, and you tell exactly what is the situation, you know, in honesty, so important because a child was coming to us and the child was on medi medication the whole time. We don't have this idea. There are child is on the medication. 
but when the child time changed and we saw the child the child came with you know big eyes red eyes and the child was not able to get anything over that we had had decided that child is have a lot of verbal issues the child have behavioral issues at that time we get this idea so before that we don't have this idea because the child was so stable every day so you know if you are you know through with the therapist and you tell her exactly what is the situation so it will help the child so uh, thank you so much for your time today and uh, it was a lovely talking to you and i will request you again for your time and at the end is, is there anything you would like to talk to our you know viewers who will watch this video later on yeah i just wanted to thank you for having me it's been a really interesting discussion and just like so it it's really interesting just to see how things translate ad- across different countries and cultures yeah. you know we, we think the same thing we're doing the same thing and we're in totally different parts of the world so it's been a wonderful experience to chat to you and um just for anyone who's listening just check out my page on instagram i am on facebook too but some of the stuff doesn't transfer across so instagram is the main place you can find me at speech therapy with charlotte and i just provide loads of free advice there so not not asking you to pay for anything and it sounds like uh, it's going to be relevant to you no matter in, where in the world you are um yeah. and um what i really want to do is i guess i'm really passionate about that idea of empowering other people to support communication development so there is a course as a role for a specialist speech therapist and your child may or may not need that but actually if you know this idea that it takes a village to raise a child if everyone in the world whether they're parents or professionals or whoever takes an interest in supporting all children's communication development then all the children will be the better for it so please check out my page whether or not you've got concerns about your child there's still stuff that you can be doing to support their communication yeah. development and even if it's not your child if you know a child which by the way you probably do because most people know a child then check out my page because there will be stuff that you can do to support their communication development and communication development honestly it, it underpins everything else so just go and check out my page and make sure that you take a proactive role in supporting your communication development please okay thank you so much and you know that is the reason, that's why i'm talking to different therapists maybe you have seen on my instagram and now you will see on my uh, facebook as well and that is the reason why i'm talking to other country therapists because everybody should know that how things are going everywhere humanity yes. is everywhere the same the way we are working with the children or the way we are, we are you know uh, dealing adult patient adult client they are the same ways so when you talk about different therapists then you 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 know as a therapist you have a lot of question in your mind from for you know from the day of start of your training so whenever you talk to some therapist at least you get new ideas new ways and new perspective as well which is refreshing for for, for me as a therapist as well thank you so much for having us uh, giving us time today and i would like to you know invite you again for a different topic and um, that was lovely discussion today and I, i you know i learned a lot of things from you today and i'm sure those who will watch you they will learn other things from you as well and uh, as she mentioned that she have a page on instagram so even on my instagram you can go and she's with attach me on the instagram as well so if you want to have a, a, if you, other people want us to you know do do more discussion like that on this topic then you get they, you can uh, you know inbox us so thank you so much everybody for watching us see you in the next session bye bye thank you thank you so, you so much all right thank you bye 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 bye